Hello my friends and welcome to our first lecture on the history of the restoration movement. In this lecture we will cover some of the physical and cultural aspects of frontier life as well as the development of Christianity on the American frontier. We will begin by making a case for the size and the scope of the frontier and how it offered unique opportunities and limitations for the American settlers. We will foreshadow later class lectures concerning how early agricultural choices, choices to grow corn, tobacco, and cotton on the frontier, all while using slave labor to provide adequate manpower for these agricultural endeavors, how this set up a series of potential problems that would have profound consequences on the American psyche. Finally, we will offer a critique of the settlers themselves by asking two questions. What sort of person comes to live in a place like this? And what sort of Christian worship thrives in a place like this? So, if you're ready, let's hit the trail and see where this road leads us. For our study this semester, we will need to spend a great deal of time talking about the American frontier. Between 1780 and 1830, the areas west of the Appalachian Mountains became the birthplace for the largest spiritual revival that we have on record, just Christian record entirely, for all 2,000 years of Christian history. And historians will call this revival the Second Great Awakening. And one of the products of this spiritual ferment was the Restoration Movement itself. And our guiding thought for today's lecture will be this. How did this land, which we call the American frontier, how did it create a people that were ripe for Christian revival and eager to pursue the ideas of New Testament restorationism and Christian primitivism. So, let us go ahead and begin by making a few general observations. And I'll start with this one. And I, no, I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence, but on this slide we have a map of the United States of America. But you will notice that this is not just a map that you're probably used to showing the 48 continental United States. Nope, this is a map showing how territory was added to the United States, starting with the 13 colonies before 1783, and it shows how additional northwestern territories were added in 1783, how Louisiana was added in 1803, how Florida was added in 1810 through 1819, how Texas was added in 1845, how Oregon was added in 1846, and how the rest of the West came to join the Americas between 1848 and 1853. And what I want you to take away from all this is that the American frontier is a large place. You see, by the time the Louisiana Purchase happened in 1803, the American frontier will span nearly from the east to the west coast, and will cover an area of nearly 2 million square miles. By 1820, one-third of the entire country's population will have moved across the Appalachian Mountains into these frontier areas. Simply put, this is just quite a lot of area for a person to get lost in, and many, many hardy American and European immigrants will accept this challenge and move out into the frontier between the, age, the years of 1800 and 1850. But you know, it is one thing to say that this is a large country. It's another thing to give it a sense of perspective. So here on this slide, on the right side, we have a map of the British Isles. This includes the countries of Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England, what we today call the United Kingdom. On the left of this map, we show the states of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. These maps are set to the exact same scale, meaning that the size of both of these areas is equal. And using this for comparison, we can see that the English-speaking countries that will produce the bulk of the American settlers is not terribly big. In fact, Ireland will fit entirely within the state of Indiana. And the area in between London and the highlands of Scotland will fit in between the cities of Detroit, Michigan, and Knoxville, Tennessee. So keep this in mind, the settlers leaving the British Isles are leaving a smaller and more crowded space to come to a much, much more open space on the American frontier.
And in general, while we are talking about perspective, let's look at the state of Indiana and give you another perspective. This is a scale map showing here on the right an area known as the Levant, or the place where nearly all of the Bible story happens. You see, in that small rectangle there on the right, over 90% of the events that are recorded in the Bible took place within that area. I want you to think about that for a second. Abraham wandering in the desert with his family. David fighting Goliath. Isaiah preaching in Jerusalem. Jesus preaching to crowds in Galilee. Paul witnessing to the governor of Caesarea. Every one of those events and many, many more all happened within that small land area. And it's a small land area that will fit within the state of Indiana. And this sheer amount of land on the American frontier will give the early Americans a sense of greatness. It's a huge land. It's a lush land. It's a fertile land. And they will see this land. And many of the American frontiersmen will say, this has got to be the new promised land for God. And we, and by extension, they will start to say, and we must be the new chosen people. Now, let us return to that first map that I showed you here. And let's point out another obvious fact. That the American frontier for a period of 70 years just kept growing. In fact, it kept growing faster than the citizens of the country could repopulate it. Not for lack of trying, mind you. But this acquisition of new land was fundamental and became one of the driving tenets of the American dream. What do you have the right for in America? Life, liberty, and we usually say the pursuit of happiness today, but the original claim was you have a claim to life, liberty, and property. And how do you get that property? America just simply needs more land for the taking. And this will offer us a particular challenge as the first generation of the Restoration Movement the people who started this movement off, that they will live east of the Mississippi River. But as the country expanded, so does the movement. And with only a few exceptions, this movement will be a frontier movement. It will not be as popular east of the Appalachian Mountains, and some within the movement, for example, Alexander Campbell, will go so far as to say that this movement just wouldn't survive in an urban environment in the more settled East Coast cities. Now, as I had alluded to earlier, another fascinating reason to study the frontier was that the largest revival on record, and again, this is entire Christian history, the largest revival on record took place during the years of, 18, or of 1780 and 1830. Now, before 1780, only about 5% of the frontier settlers were believing Christians with any commitment to weekly worship. In short, we could say only about 5% of the people on the frontier were saved, as we would call them today. By the end of this period, over 90% of the people would become believers with a solid commitment to weekly worship, evangelism, and the betterment of society in Jesus' name. All of the major Christian groups, such as the Baptists, the Methodists, and yes, even the non-denominational congregations of the Restoration Movement, will see exponential increase in their membership and public support during this time. And the basic takeaway from all this is that while the Restoration Movement is not the only evangelical movement on the frontier, it will be one of the highly successful ones out there. And so, to understand the story of the Restoration Movement as a unique force among the evangelical denominations requires a very nuanced attention to how they were similar and to how they were different from their competing denominational peers. In light, later lectures, we will look at how the Restoration Movement differed from these evangelical denominations, while in this lecture, we're going to look at these similarities in what James White collectively calls frontier worship. So let's start by giving an outline for how the next couple of weeks are going to focus our study on certain individuals who will form pockets 
of Restorationism, or epicenters of the Restoration movement. Simply put, this movement did not start up in one day, and then the next day it simply spanned across the entire frontier. No, between the years of 1780 and 1815, we'll call this the first generation years of the Restoration Movement, we're only going to see small local pockets of Restorationism springing up all over the place. Now, eventually these Restorationists will start spreading their message, and eventually some of them will meet together and they'll form larger organizations. But for these early years, most of these pockets are going to remain isolated in individual movements. And we'll need to look at those pockets individually. And again, as I said, this will give us a rough outline for the next couple of weeks of study. And we'll be looking at them in roughly chronological order. Which ones sprang up first? Those are the ones we'll talk about first. And so, just briefly, we will go through these in roughly this order. We'll talk first about the James O'Kelly movement in Southern Virginia. We'll talk about the Abner Jones movement in Vermont and New Hampshire. We'll talk about Elias Smith and his movement in Eastern Pennsylvania. We'll talk about Barton Stone in Northern Kentucky. And then we'll talk about the Campbells, the Campbell movement started by Thomas and Alexander Campbell, along with their friend Walter Scott. And they will be the dominant force in western Pennsylvania, and they'll spread through to Ohio and western Virginia. So now, let's shift gears a bit, and let's talk about some practical questions, like travel. How did these early settlers get to the frontier? Well, while there are theoretically hundreds of ways to get there today, thanks to modern roads and cars, in the era before 1810, there were no paved roads west of the Appalachian Mountains, and most people were limited to one of two main routes in order to get to the frontier. And the first of those routes is a land route, and it goes through a small gap in the Appalachian Mountains known as the Cumberland Gap. It's in the southwest area of Virginia. This route allowed people to cross the mountains at a low level of elevation, and it provided the biggest gateway into the lands of Kentucky and Tennessee, not to mention Ohio and Indiana. And all totaled up, we used to call this area O Kentuckiana in Cincinnati, simply because the culture was very similar and had this kind of rural frontierism even today. Now, this trail through the Cumberland Gap has a pretty storied legacy. In the year of 1775, one year before the start of the American Revolutionary War, An explorer by the name of Daniel Boone and his team will blaze the trail across the gap, allowing for both foot travel and cart travel if pulled by a horse or mule. And this will allow for travel into Kentucky and into Tennessee. Boone was known for advocating that Americans just needed a little bit of elbow room. And by this he meant that there needed to be enough space where they could live a considerable distance apart from one another so that they could achieve both individual independence and that they could become self-supporting. You see, for Boone, he recommended that every settler should live probably about 25 miles apart from each other. Now, while this seems somewhat silly to us today, who probably don't live more than, you know, 500 feet apart from their next-door neighbor, it does demonstrate that these early settlers were driven to live on the frontier, and to not have anyone near them who could tell them how to live, how to act. And in religious sense, they didn't live near enough to people who could tell them how to worship. So this settlement process, by traveling through the Cumberland Gap, will happen both quickly and explosively, as nearly 200,000 people will move west and take up residence in Kentucky and Tennessee. By 1792, 17 years after Boone blazed his trail, Kentucky will have a sufficient population that they can apply for statehood. By 1796, 21 years after Boone blazed his trail, Tennessee will follow suit and they will become a state as well. By 1800, Ohio and Indiana will have enough of a population that it at least requires a form of government to rule over these territories. And the thing to keep in mind about all this is that the frontier attracted a lot of people. 
And so we're not just talking about a few ornery hillbillies who just wanted to get away from civilization and live in the mountains. What we're talking about here is nearly a quarter of a million people, and they were looking for something. They were looking for something that the cultured cities to the east just couldn't give them. And by the time of Andrew Jackson's presidency, this would be our seventh president, one out of three Americans will have moved west and have settled in the frontier. Well, the Cumberland Gap proved to be a great land-based route if you were going to travel from Virginia or the Carolinas to get into Kentucky and Tennessee. But what about people living in the north? How did the people in the Yankee states migrate to the frontier? Well, the simple answer to that is that they made their way to God's second most holy city. They went to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just happen to be a pretty big Steelers fan, so any chance I can get to talk positively about the Steel City, I'm going to take it. But all joking aside, the city of Pittsburgh, or Fort Pitt, as it was known during the days of the American Revolution, offered an impressive water route for northern settlers to migrate to the frontier. You see, in Pittsburgh, two large rivers, the Allegheny River and the Monongahela River, merged to form the Ohio River. And the Ohio River is one of the largest rivers in the United States, even today. And it offered a convenient one-way route to the frontier. In fact, a person could easily reach the states of West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and even Illinois simply by floating on a flatboat downstream on the Ohio. But as I had said on the previous slide, in the early days of settlement, the Ohio River was a one-way ticket. You see, before the advent of steam-powered engines, boats were often at the mercy of the current of the river, and they had to utilize wind power, set up sails, and let the wind push their boat upstream. Well, the Ohio River's current is rather fast, and the curvy nature of the water does not lend itself to harnessing wind power effectively. The result is that many settlers will build watercraft known as flatboats, and they will simply sail down, south, and west down the Ohio. And, you know, when the scenery looked pleasant enough, that's where they'd stop, and that's where they settle. And so cities like Cincinnati, Louisville, Huntington, and Evansville, all of these cities will be founded by these early river-traveling settlers, and there will be settlers who were going down the river not expecting to come back to civilization, as it were. And incidentally, a few decades later, the American writer Mark Twain will romanticize this riverboat culture with his fictional stories uh, of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. So, the Ohio River, like crossing the Cumberland Gap, would become symbols of adventure and they become symbols of greater American freedom. They become symbols of personal liberty and autonomy. So now with that basic framework, let me pose a question I'm reckoning some of you are probably already thinking. What kind of a man or woman subjects themselves to this kind of rigorous travel only to lead a rugged lifestyle once they get there? It's not like they're leaving to go to another city. They're leaving the city to go to the middle of nowhere, and that's exactly the way they want it. Well, one possible answer to this question comes from a mid-20th century historian named Frederick Jackson Turner. Turner suggests that the sort of person who goes out of their way to go to the frontier to become a settler is looking for a pressure release valve from the pressures and demands of civilized society. To avoid the problems of a government meddling in your day-to-day -day affairs, to avoid the problems of taxation, to avoid the problem of bossy upper-class people telling you what to do and how to live, these settlers will just ditch it all and go west to release the pressure. They will cross the Cumberland Gap, they will sail down the Ohio River with no real intention of returning to the society they left. And there, where they will build their homesteads far away from other people, they will do it all for the sake of finding an expression for this liberty and this pursuit of happiness that the young American government was telling them was right there for the taking. So, 
Let me follow that up by asking a different question. What do these settlers do when they finally get to the frontier and they build their houses away from polite society? Well, here's a hint. The biggest money maker for these people will be the production of something brown, smooth, and likely to make you dance. No, 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 they didn't try to make clones of Usher. And while Usher is technically from a frontier area, because he got his start in Atlanta, Georgia, there's going to be a far more ancient product that these early settlers will choose to farm. Yep, they planted corn. In fact, they planted so much corn that it became the frontier's biggest cash crop. However, the most popular corn product on the frontier will be to distill corn mash into a product called bourbon whiskey. And it's a process that was supposedly perfected by George Thurup. And by the turn of the century, sometime around 1800, bourbon whiskey will be the number one trade good on the frontier, sometimes even taking the place of cash itself. So, can you picture that? A world where physical dollars and coins are hard to come by, but whiskey is so plentiful that people will just trade bottles and flask of it instead of actually trading physical money. And this will be an ongoing trend that we'll talk about concerning religion in rural and frontier America. The primary way for many of these hard-working farmer types to make a living at least, is to be growing crops that will support what we can call vice industries, like the production of alcoholic beverages. Now, before we go on, don't get me wrong. I agree, the Bible never condemns alcohol use. It only regulates alcohol abuse. But on the American frontier, by the 1860s, the abuse of alcohol will reach epidemic proportions. And when this happens, Christians living on the frontier will begin to rethink their connections with these types of industries. Some of the people that we will study in this class will be intimately involved with a movement known as Prohibition, and specifically Prohibition sought to block the production and consumption of alcohol entirely. But corn wasn't the only cash crop that was being produced on the frontier. Especially in areas like Virginia and North and South Carolina, one of the primary products they're going to grow is this product called tobacco. Now, I'm sure you already know how this works, but I'll humor you here in case you don't. Tobacco is a leafy plant that contains high levels of a stimulant known as nicotine. And from the earliest days of American colonization, there was a high demand for tobacco products that could either be chewed, snorted, or smoked. On the frontier, the production of tobacco and the consumption of tobacco products will just become an acceptable part of social life, and both Christians and non-Christians will partake in this early on. And to give an example of how this plays out, I once heard a uh, Kentucky preacher give advice to people in a preaching class I took, and he gave us this advice. He said, never preach against drinking or smoking in areas like Kentucky, because odds are the people in your congregations will make a living farming corn or farming tobacco themselves. And if they don't, they probably have someone important in their life who depends on one of these two vice industries to make a living. And the result will be that as frontier Christianity grows and it matures and it starts asking moral questions, there's going to be an ideological conflict that's going to be brought about, as Christians are going to start to question, is it right or is it valid to get caught up in farming agricultural products that can be addictive or that can have potentially dangerous side effects or put dangerous substances into the body? Now, the third most important cash crop on the American frontier is going to be particularly popular in the Deep South, and that's a crop known as cotton. Now, cotton, unlike whiskey or tobacco, is a benign substance. It's not something that's going to get you addicted to a harmful substance. But the problem with cotton is that the production of cotton was innately bound up with the use of slave labor. Beginning in 1619, slaves began to be imported to the British colonies from West Africa. And by the 1800s, slave labor is simply a staple of southern agricultural production. 
So, while cotton is not a vice industry in and of itself, the institution of slavery is, because it requires the use and abuse of a person for someone else's gain. So, now, be careful to take note that all three of these social issues, alcohol, which can lead to alcoholism, tobacco, which can lead to things like lung cancer and just a slow poisoning of the body, and slavery, which involves actually subjugating other human beings, that all three of these issues, when they began, were originally seen as neutral, or sometimes even beneficial to society. But what's going to happen is, evangelical Christians on the frontier, as they become converted and start asking hard moral questions, are going to start asking, is it right to keep doing these things? And it's going to be problematic because they are going to be very ingrained. They're going to be some things that have been uh, practiced for several generations before these kind of questions start coming up. And this will become a very important part of our study as the conflicts with vice industry within Christianity are going to play a significant role in the history of the Restoration Movement. And as I said, Christians are going to begin to question the morality of the institutions of slavery. They're going to question the morality of alcohol production. They're going to question the morality of tobacco production. And, this, and as they are driven to reform society, this American dream of freedom and personal liberty will clash with the Christian ideal of, can we make this society a better and more moral place? And... I can just promise you now, we will see this again and again and again in this class. As evangelical Christianity becomes the dominant religion on the American frontier, these new converts will start asking questions, moral questions, about their cultural practices, and the problem is going to be these cultural practices will form the cornerstone of their economy and their society. Now, obviously, slavery will become the biggest flashpoint. But the problems of alcohol prohibition in the late 1800s and the rise of the holiness movement in the 1900s will spark numerous debates between Christian ethics and these participants in vice industries. So, let's go ahead and shift gears once again and discuss the shape of Christianity on the frontier. Probably the easiest way to paint this picture for you is to show you two radically different styles of church architecture. The picture on the left-hand side of the slide is taken from a cathedral in Europe. The picture on the right-hand side of the slide is taken from Cane Ridge, a meeting house in Kentucky. Notice the difference between these two churches. The European church is covered in colorful paint. All of the major objects are just overlaid with gold and silver. The facing of the building itself is faced with expensive stone, and literally it took hundreds of years to build. The Cane Ridge Meeting House, on the other hand, while it's actually one of the largest log cabins in the United States, it doesn't have any of this finery, does it? The wood beams, the wooden pews, they're simple, they're functional. And the space is made to be undistracting. There's nothing pretty here to look at. And I would suggest that these pictures form a microcosm of the difference between the frontier and old world Christianity. You see, on the frontier, the people lack the financial resources and even the drive to build what could be called monumental churches. They built simple churches, and they were built for simple people, and as a result, the expressions of Christian religion on the frontier were often practical. They are often pragmatic, meaning, if it worked, we did it. And they are explicitly made to appeal to the common person. So now, let's kind of take this apart and talk about some of the major aspects of frontier religion that were common to all evangelical Christians, including other people who were, got involved with the Restoration Movement. So again, these are things that all evangelicals had in common on the frontier, and not just something that was common to the Restoration Movement. So, the first major aspect of frontier religion that I wanted to talk about is simply prompted by the fact that there are more churches than there were preachers to serve them. And the result, particularly among groups such as the Methodists, the Baptists, and the Presbyterians, is that 
they will start to advocate this idea that the preacher should travel to many churches preaching as they go. And we'll even see this in the Restoration Movement. For example, Barton Stone will preach at three different churches every Sunday. This practice is known as itinerant preaching. Itinerant preaching created the expectation that a minister would simply just be willing to go to great lengths to preach the gospel, and that the only really trustable clergy person out there was the kind of man who was willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel. And particularly among the Baptist and early uh, people in the Restoration Movement, this idea of bivocational ministry will become the name of the game. For example, many Restoration Movement ministers, such as Alexander Campbell, will make their livings as teachers and as farmers, and they will use that money so that they can travel and preach on Sundays. Now, going hand in hand with this lack of ordained preachers is going to be the rise of lay leadership, or lay ministers. Since there could be no guarantee that a circuit-riding minister could come and serve at a remote church every week, many of these duties of day-to-day ministry are going to fall on the members of the congregation themselves. Now, you see, before the 1800s, every denomination required an ordination process before a person could be licensed to preach, before they could be licensed to perform a baptism, to perform a wedding, or to even preside at the Lord's Supper. And just for one example, the Presbyterian Church had a lengthy process requiring that anyone wanting to become a minister had to take a written test and then have a formal interview before a review board before that person could be licensed to preach. If you wanted to actually be a minister, you had to do an even more extensive process, take a test, review board. And so... Often, you could run into a problem that a person could be licensed to preach, but not necessarily licensed to baptize or to perform the Lord's Supper. And on the frontier, waiting for a professionally trained minister with, from the right denomination to come to your church to perform these duties just became highly impractical. The result is that the offices of elder and deacon will become much more significant on the frontier. Churches will often appoint people within their own number to preach and to perform other sacramental actions that, well, to be honest, before the 1800s, could only be done by officially ordained ministers. And the result of all this is that many individual churches and a few denominations entirely will lose this idea of sacramentalism. Here's how this plays out for you. I'm assuming that most of you all today, my students, fall into this paradigm that many of you are not ordained, yet I'm willing to bet that most of you have probably performed some of these sacramental actions. Most of you have probably either preached or taught a Sunday school. Most of you have probably prayed out loud during communion. Some of you may have even baptized your friends or family members, but you did so necessarily with ordination. Now, Worship on the frontier was incredibly simple. The Bible became the primary symbol for Christianity on the frontier. If a church did use hymnals at all, they would only use a few different tunes of printed music, while the bulk of their hymnals would be just the words for the songs only. Can you picture that? Being at a church where you really only have four songs, and you just switch out the words. This is the way it was on the early frontiers, where a person could sing a hundred hymns, but we only really know four different melodies, or maybe twelve if we have a really complicated hymnal. And it would not be until the later revivals of the 1830s and afterwards that each hymn would become to be unique. That, for example, when we sing Amazing Grace, we're not going to sing it to a different tune other than the tune that goes with Amazing Grace. And likewise, this idea of service books will be abandoned on the frontier. Now, I'm sure some of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, so let me explain this. Before the 1800s, prayers in churches are scripted, and they come in uh, prescribed and professionally done books called liturgical service books. On the frontier, this idea, when you pray, you pray spontaneously, is going to become cherished and expected. 
And this is why all churches that are influenced by frontier religion today pray extemporaneously. Simply put, when people go up to pray, they pray whatever is on their mind and in their heart. They're not going to read from a book. And this is going to be very different from what will be called liturgical churches, which will pray from these service books, the prayers will be memorized, and when the prayers happen, the entire congregation will pray and chant these prayers in unison. Now, one of the more interesting and puzzling things that will happen in frontier worship is going to be this development of what I'll call enthusiastic worship. Starting around 1800, worshipers began experiencing a wide variety of spiritual manifestations. The people who practiced these things call them spiritual exercises, and they range from spontaneously singing to weird stuff like barking like a dog or whipping their head back and forth so ferociously that you could hear their hair snap like a bullwhip. And it should be noted that this was also what can be called an ecumenical phenomenon, meaning that it crossed denominational barriers. Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Restorationists will all experience this phenomenon of enthusiastic worship to some extent. Another interesting aspect of frontier worship was the reorientation of the purpose of worship itself. Before the 1800s, most church denominations saw the purpose of Sunday morning worship was to appeal to baptized believers. Their goal was to edify and equip the saints while, if they did evangelism, it happened outside the church walls, in the marketplace, in the home. But on the frontier, this whole idea is going to radically shift, and the primary reason for this is there's not much to do on the frontier. So even non-believers will begin attending church, mainly because it was one of the more interesting things to do where people would gather together. And so what will happen is, even though at the beginning of the 1800s, where only about 5% of the people are saved, or at least as we would call them saved today, a, every major denomination is going to start focusing on evangelism. And everyone, including the Restoration Movement people, are going to start using their worship services and camp meetings to preach the gospel to these visiting unbelievers. Now, the goal of frontier worship is going to be explicitly to appeal to unbelievers. And as a result, there's going to be a focus that a good worship service should end in a conversion of somebody. Somebody should get saved when they come to church. Now, this is going to look different across the denominations. Some groups, like the Presbyterians and the Methodists, will start doing things like making altar calls, and they will request non-visiting or non-believing visitors to come forward and accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, groups that have a baptism focus, groups like the Baptist or the Restoration Movement people, are going to tend to focus that a good worship service should be taken outside the church walls, down to the river, and should end in a baptism if someone converts. And so, keep in mind that all churches today, if you go into a church that has a mandatory invitation for unbelievers to repent, and if you know that it's going to happen every service, this whole practice came about because they're influenced by frontier worship traditions. Now, a final aspect of frontier religion that I want to discuss is this prevalence of a cappella singing, or singing without instruments. You see, it is time-consuming to make a quality musical instrument. And on the frontier, few people had the time to make it, the experience of how to make a good instrument, or if, they, if it was more a matter of purchase, few people had the money to purchase a good musical instrument. And the result is that most of the singing on the frontier churches did not involve instrumental accompaniment. Now, this trend is going to change by the 1860s as civilization and professional musicians will finally move out and get caught up with the frontier. But by this time, there's already a steady tradition, you know. In, you do something for 60 years, it's going to become traditional. And so by this time, there's going to be a steady tradition of non-instrumental singing. And they're going to have to wrestle with the question, do we start using instruments now or not? Do we break our tradition? And this will be particularly important for the Restoration Movement and a few Baptist groups, as they will experience divisions over the use of musical instruments in worship.
So let's go ahead and end this first lecture by making a few concluding points and tie it all off with a pretty little bow. Probably the most profound result of all of this rough and tumble lifestyle that was prevalent on the frontier will be the revival of this notion called primitivism. Simply put, primitivism is even more conservative than conservatism. You see, where conservatives usually wish to keep a status quo from changing, a primitivist will say the status quo isn't good enough. It's the old ways that are better, better than modern ways. And we need to go back to living and thinking that way as soon as possible. And this can be seen in the American politic in the sphere of American politics, where people will disregard the notions of monarchy, you know, everywhere else they have a king. But Americans will look way back into the ancient Greek and early Roman days, and they will try to find ways of establishing a democratic republic. Now, with regards to religion, primitivism will lead to this idea of strict biblicism. And by this I mean, biblicism is a notion that only the things found in the scripture are legitimate for the faith and practice of the Christian religion. And this is a much, much more intense version of Martin Luther's doctrine of sola scriptura, or the scriptures alone. You see, where Martin Luther would demand that a person had to show where in scripture something is wrong, a primitivist would argue that before a church can do anything, you had to find in scripture where it was right. And the result is that many frontier denominations will look to the Bible, and the Bible alone, for details on how to construct their worship services, on how to organize their local church. And throughout this class, we'll look at the pros and cons of this idea, and it will become one of the major focuses of this class. Now, a second important result of American frontier culture is going to be the prevalence of this idea known as anti-authoritarianism. Now, now, don't get it intimidated. This is simply a compound word that means that the frontier settlers didn't like the idea of a government or anyone else in authority telling them how to live. And even today, this is a quintessential American value. I have the right to choose my own destiny for myself, many of us will say. Well, and this plays out in numerous, numerous ways. No one will tell me who to get married to. I'll decide that for myself. Oh, you want my vote for this upcoming election? What are you going to promise me in return? And this belief that a person has the right to govern their own life and to make decisions, political and otherwise, for themselves will invade every area of life, including in matters of religion. And today, most American Christians just kind of take this for granted. For example, if a person can read, most people assume that person can also interpret the Bible for themselves. They don't need a preacher or a priest to tell them what to believe. And this is why most American missionaries, that they work so hard to translate the Bible and to educate the people how to read. It is a prevailing notion that as long as a person has access to the scriptures, they can decide what it means for themselves. But I would like to recommend that this does have a dark side, and that this is going to be the number one reason why there are so many denominations in America today. Anti-authoritarianism asserts that the beliefs and liberty of the individual are paramount, resulting in that there's going to be as many opinions about the Bible as there will be people who can read it. And I would like to suggest that this becomes a crisis of authority, and we'll be diving into this question literally every week in this class. How can the church establish something like correct doctrine when everyone is reading the Bible for themselves? And as they do it, they are carrying a deep, deep distrust of human authority. How does that work out? Well, we'll explore that further as the weeks go on, but... I'm planting the seed now. Think about that. Let it germinate. We'll talk about it later. Have a good day and God bless you, my friends.